Welcome everyone, Costini here with the campaign guide for Corunta in Total War Pharaoh. Now, Corunta is the challenger to the Hittite throne, and I think he has the much harder campaign compared to King Shupalyuma. See, King Shupalyuma, he starts as the Great King. He's gonna have all the benefits that come from starting as the Great King, including the ability to vassalize other factions, which can be a significant strength early on in his campaign. He also starts with free territories and can get the gold mine very, very quickly. So if you're looking to play a Hittite campaign that's easier, then Shupalyuma is in a better position. Kurunta, however, he wants to bring the downfall Kurunta. of the Hittite Empire, the way I would see it. Or he's the pretender to the throne. Depends on how you view that particular situation. He does start with the tier 3 settlement that does have the Grand Temple of Kurunta. Yes, talk about the narcissist calling himself a, by the name Man of a god. He also starts with the native Musterfield, which is going to start at tier 2. Now, in Kurunta's campaign, as a starting uh, situation. You do start with Touch an army with of blade, eight units, uh, two Kaskin warrior units, two spear Luwian spearmen, three uh, Isuan militia, and Karunta himself. And there are two I armies that he's I matched choose. against. Now, if you could theoretically take over uh, Sibria, uh, Sibira uh, on turn one, that would be a significant ah, no. benefit because it would help you out very, uh, very early on in a campaign. But doing so, from my experience, is actually a far course. taller order than you might think. You could decide to wait one turn. Don't construct anything in your particular settlement. The reason you don't want to construct anything... Like, here's the benefit of taking this settlement out on stag. turn one. The reason you benefit Touching from taking this out on turn one, sad. though you may not have the forces to go up against 15 units, like we just did. Like, sure, spirit. you're doing dealing with them one at a time, but still is a hard sell. But the reason you might benefit immensely from taking this element on turn one is you could start getting the native muster office very, very quickly. Because the units you can recruit here, Supreme the Luin Swordsmen are okay. Don't get me wrong on that. And it's not like you're going to get so much out of tier, uh, the tier 3 settlement, but obviously the units you're going to get over here, like the armored Anatolian Spears, the Isuan Axemen, the, uh, the armored Hittite skirmishers do and the Hittite archers are going to give you a significant amount of combat benefit. Right on the flip side, you can just auto-resolve the first battle, assuming you're playing your on legendary, well. and you can. W this army here I will right attack now. you. So once you're de uh, w so, if you auto-resolve, it depends on the number of casualties. I have found in every Always start hunting. I had of a campaign, at least on legendary, very hard that this army will always attack Runta, and you will always win against that army over there and then be able to take the settlement. One of the things to get used to as Karunta very quickly in a campaign though, sacking settlements and then occupying them. See, you might think it's a bad idea because you're going to do damage to the settlements, but here's what sacking a settlement is going to give you. It's going to give you bronze, it's going to give you food. Yes, you will lose the material and it's going to give you gold, Yes, you will have to spend stone and wood to build the settlement, but stone and wood are not the trouble resources in a campaign. It is bronze, food, gold in that particular order. Bronze in particular is an issue. So if you're playing Kurunta especially, who does have a limited start and limited resources at the beginning because you start with the food settlement, there's another food settlement, there's a stone settlement, it is probably in your best interest to get as much bronze as, as possible. And What's interesting about this is when you sack the settlement and then occupy it, you will still gain the workforce, those two workforces. It's never really a good idea to occupy and loot a settlement unless you're talking about provincial uh, capitals. That is a different discussion. So let's say you were to take you know, what the settlement, a sacred sign like this one, right, with the Grand Temple. That would, it would not be a good idea to sack that, a settlement that has a lot of structures. But these minor settlements in particular, there's a lot of benefits you can gain from sacking. I kind of wish I had realized that because I have spent 70 hours in this game and it took me that long to realize, hey, wait a minute, the economy by default is fairly limited. 
But you can gain, you can really keep yourself going if you're saying he's selling. I just didn't want to do it because I figured, okay, I'm gonna have, you know, I'm not necessarily gonna gain a lot of resources. But once you understand the dynamic that wood and stone are not really too much of a significant aspect, whereas bronze is, then you realize that sacking a lot of the minor settlements, not the provincial capitals, is benefit a beneficial affair. And even with provincial capitals, if it's a, like a tier one, tier two capital and it doesn't have any other buildings or very limited buildings, even then it can be worth it. Don't do it in a tier 5 settlement or anything Sorry, higher terrible. than uh, a tier 3 settlement. And certainly don't do it on the Pillars of Civilization. That is a really bad idea in many, many ways because you're also going to reduce Fear civilization. Unless you're playing as Irsu, in which case you may not care about reducing civilization, but for everyone else, reducing civilization is a net negative. So, that campaign dynamic aside in Corinthus' campaign, let's talk about one of the main issues Corinthus is going to have. You want to get, gain the throne of Hati. That means going up against Shupoluma. But in order to declare war against Shupoluma, you need to take a lot of these sacred sites in order to gain the legitimacy required to be able to start the civil war. And Shupoluma is going to be more powerful than you. Like, I've played Shupoluma campaigns. Like, default settings, customized settings, he is ridiculously powerful. It's like, oh, he has a hard starting position. He's probably the strongest legendary lord in the game. I'm not even joking on that. Um, in fact, if you're playing Shupoluma campaign, you can avoid the civil war altogether, which is something you can't do in Egypt. But if you're playing Kurunta, you're going to have to trigger that civil war. The power of the crown is significant, so you're going to want to do it. And also, if you don't trigger a civil war, if you don't act as a pretender, you can't vassalize factions, so you're losing a significant amount of power because of that. So that means taking a lot, a lot of sacred sites. So those are some of the campaign dynamics. You're going to need sacred sites. You're going to want to capture them. Now, let's talk about his faction and what does he gain. He gets income. Uh, he gets a Shamsu Hor. Uh, uh, rather, his command. His active command is that your armies gain more income from raising settlements but if you do activate this, you will not be able to colonize ruins until the next Shemso Horse cycle. I do not believe that this is worth using, pretty much ever. Unless you're deep in enemy territory and don't care about raising it, or Shemso Horse is going to happen next turn, so you might just benefit for, you know, from doing so. But at the same time, his passive command, reducing enemy morale, can give you the edge in battle that you do need. In terms of the court situation, your plots are stronger than other factions, starting at level 2 and going up to level 6. Plots are useful because they can give you a ton of benefits in a court. Crucially, you can eliminate people from positions that you want to occupy. So that's the main benefit of plots. Uh, then when we're talking about titles, your titles allow your armies to specialize in Casca and Fidrogen units. You can also unlock the Shadow Stands for your generals and allow them to reduce happiness in their location. Now, I don't think the Shadow Stance, like, just based I on that description, is worth divine. it, and it, to unlock it, it, is, it does require a significant amount of investment in points that you may not necessarily want to do, because you would need to spend in presence, ignore fortitude, basically spend a lot of presence and ardor. I don't think that's really worth it. But looking at his titles that he can get, he can get Recruit Rank plus free. Uh, if he's going to pick up Overseer of the Militia. So if you're going free in Presence, you're going to get plus free Recruit rank over there. And because you start with the Mercenary Office in his campaign, you're going to be able to recruit the, uh, units at rank 5. Kurunta. So you already start with the ability of recruiting units at rank 2. So you're, you can get feet. some very elite armies with Kurunta fairly early on in his campaign and all you need to do is get a bunch of presents other titles like the unit titles that you're talking about like mist walkers all that kind of stuff i wouldn't say that's too important but you can get concealer of truth so you can get uh, you can reduce the enemy movement on land if you're going for eight uh eight presents so you can get uh, reduce the enemy movement on land and influence though typically speaking i would say getting ardor is probably the more significant benefit uh, other things that I would argue could be useful, like getting the Immortal for a significant amount of fortitude, so you can get extra replenishment from taking on after a bell, or Pious Steeds, if you're going for Ardor, getting 20% movement after a prayer can be really uh, significant. 
You can also get Overseer of Conscripts if you get all of these benefits. And it would reduce the workforce growth, but this is not an issue because you're not going to keep an army in a province you like you're actually trying to grow. Like, you should move that army anyway. So there are some useful titles. The higher-end stuff, like, you can get Horse Worshipper, but requires a significant amount of benefits. And you can also uh, get rules with blood for a lot of influence, kill captive duration, but also at the cost of happiness. Corunta does start with an Anatolian Dirk, a common shield, and a common medium armor in his campaign. And once you declare your legitimacy for the throne, you are going to get an epic item, but you need to do that first. Though, whether or not you want to put a bow as an item on one of your generals, that is a discussion. Typically speaking, when it comes to generals, I prefer to have one and melee. Even Ramesses, like at least Ramesses can have the ability of shooting while moving with his bow, so you might want to use that until you get the you know melee weapon on him. But still, like once you get the decent melee weapon, you want to get uh, rid of that. Now, in terms of in terms of his unique buildings, he gets the military sabotage camp that reduces movement online, melee attack, and increases your rate income. You can get a mercenary hunt camp for upkeep, food income, and XP per turn. And you get the mercenary office for recruitment slots, recruitment rank, but at the cost of influence. Now, speaking about um, uh, speaking about ancient legacy, I would say the benevolent is the far better choice. The, getting a couple of generals, like up to five generals that have unique titles is useful. But the vanilla benevolent gives you instant construction and for free. So you don't have to spend a lot of gold for instant construction. That is an enormous benefit. Like free instant construction is a gigantic benefit that I don't like. Very few other ancient legacies match, honestly. Like that alone would probably make it the best ancient legacy, really. Though overall, I'd say like in terms of like overall benefits, I'd say the Egyptian and ancient legacies are better. But you don't have that choice. It's just like you at least have instant construction and you do get better courtesy gifts courtesy gifts are either resources or units that your vassals give you so going for an ancient legacy as the benevolent is a better choice now um let's talk about units that Karunta has before i go over the overall campaign plan so you start the native muster field and these units that you get from Karunta starting situation will be pretty good early on for much much of the early game so you start with the ability of recruiting louian um louian spearmen and louian swordsmen the spearmen they use only armored good against chariots but really it's the swordsmen i would say take the cake like they they've got pretty high level armor armor though keep in mind Shupaliuma does have more heavily armored units that can do more damage than you. Uh, at tier 3, you can get Isu 1 Axemen, medium units, but still 75 armor a good uh, and a good level of damage. Skirmishers, as well as Hittite Archers. You'll also get the Armored Anatolian Spearmen, and then at tier 4, you get Armored Anatolian uh, Swordsmen, heavily armored, renowned Isu 1 Axemen, still medium infantry, but... Absolutely a heavily armored unit with a good amount of damage and heavy Anatolian chariots. In terms of his unique build, uh, units, he lacks any kind of archer, so you're going to have to rely on native units for that, but that's not really too big of an issue. Um, he does get uh, Hittite tribesmen, which are two-handed spear infantry, but it's really at tier 3 with the infantry barracks that he can get Hittite chargers. Now, this is a heavily armored unit that does a good amount of uh, armor piercing. They're not clubmen, but they're still quite capable. And at tier 5, you get the Hittite vanguard, which are clubmen. So all of their damage is pure armor piercing, heavily armored unit, probably the best heavy infantry unit in the entire game. Obviously, they're lacking shields, so they don't necessarily have the durability that some other units have, but all the same. Uh, in terms of the mercenary outpost, you get Caskian clubmen into Phrygian mercenaries, into Caskian warriors, so Caskian warriors like light infantry. I would probably not bother with these guys, uh, with exception like the veteran Phrygian mercenaries, because again, decent level of armor piercing, ranged weapon, precursor weapon basically, and good level of armor uh, that you do. Have. The economy is obviously an issue with Hatti in general. I'd say the economic potential of the Hittites, unless they go into Egyptian land, is certainly far more uh, limited than it is, you know, for for what the Egyptians or the Canaanites do have. In terms of research, just to cover this very quickly, I would probably say 
getting Legacy of Hati for Workforce Growth is probably the best thing in the world. Longer festivals also can be a good thing. Rebellions aren't really too much of an issue in this game because they finally removed the freaking difficulty modifier, so you're very rarely going to face a rebellion. You need to screw up in a major way to face a rebellion, which is kind of what it should be. Like, and most likely you'd only face rebellion if you're looting and, sack and looting and occupying every settlement. Not sacking and looting and occupying every settlement. And even then, like, it is fairly rare. Like, I've seen some rebellions in campaigns, but extremely, extremely rare. I'm talking here, like, basic game settings, let alone the fact that you can change it to increase the happiness so you don't have to deal with that nonsense. Uh, in terms of, like, long-term research, getting another god is obviously very useful. But I would not necessarily rush for that. So I would get workforce growth. I would get experience per turn. And what do you do after? You could get native officers. Or you can go down the path of charm offensive. Because that diplomatic benefit into uh, defending from the undependable. So get, uh, getting the extra food capacity, especially as you're going to reach crisis. And generally speaking, a campaign crisis is going to happen pretty quickly. But going all the way over here into Born of the Earth can be a significant benefit. On As other options, you could get, you know, construction time reduction, all that. There's a bunch of research that you can get. Uh, but typically speaking, I would say diplomacy is useful. God slots are useful, of course. God slots can be very, very useful to get as well. Uh, speaking about the gods, you do start worshipping Karunta, as you act. might expect in a campaign. Now, I can't really show what worshipping Karunta does, but you, like worshipping Karunta gives you charge bonus on recruitment. Um, and I'll just go over the bonuses I as I load up another it. another campaign, like a longer campaign over here, like this is just started. Now, what do you want to do as your plan? Well, let's look at the situation. Your east is fairly secure, believe it or not. So you've got this minor faction and you've got Shupaluma's vassal here. These two factions are probably not, like neither of them is going to declare war on you. What happens further east is not an issue. To the north... The, this faction right here does this like Shupaluma, so they're probably going to end up at war with each other. So they're probably going to be wiped out by Shupaluma or vassalized by them. So your north, your direct north, is actually secure. Now, what you should be concerned about is the situation to the west. And it's not necessarily something you're forced to do, but it's something you can benefit from doing. So what I would recommend is beyond taking our initial province is you can go over here and you know, start taking this territory from Parfa. Now, the reason you wanna do so, because if we look at these two, they start a war with each other. Generally, the Fergians are stronger, like out of these two factions between Parha, Parha and the Fergians. The Fergians generally tend to win out, though they both start with uh, six, uh, with two, uh, with one army each of six units. The AI can be really weird. Sometimes it breaks and doesn't recruit units. I've seen that happen. Like there's been campaigns where like this faction right here doesn't recruit any units. I'll talk about Cyprus in a moment. But what you do is you take this province and then you probably would want to march west to take Isaura. Now you should have a full stack over here. Take this territory, sell it. Or hold on to it in West Hati. Uh, though, like, when you want to move to the West is your decision. You could move very quickly or you can let them weaken each other. And instead march over here to take Central Hati. Because this faction, again, it's like this faction is also going to be pretty weak. So your natural campaign expansion plan is like going to Lystria and then taking out uh, Central Hati. You are not going to take the gold mine unless you declare war on the Phrygians, which is not a great idea because this territory doesn't have any sacred land. Yes, there is a center of civilization over here, a sacred land, or, uh, not the sacred land. Uh, there is a pillar of civilization here. But what is better to do from my perspective is you take this territory and then you march north and you're not necessarily going to gain control of direct provinces, but what you can do is like once you've taken these two territories you can either march south to take most of this area maybe even north or get the second army to march north get a bunch of looming swordsmen spearmen uh axemen like get uh get the native units over here like you should try one of the keys to success i might add is like getting multiple armies yes it was well bankrupt 
with you, but combination of a couple of armor that Anatolia's peer, Asuan Axemen, Skirmishers, and yes, even Swordsmen um, from Tier 2 would do quite well against everyone else. It is something that will bankrupt you. But one army, likely under Karunta, could take all of this territory. So there's a gold mine, there's a food, there's food over here, there's bronze. And once you're in this position and declare war on Shapoliuma's vassal, you take Tawana out, and then you march north, you take these two provinces. That's what Karunta's army would do. Now keep in mind, this is going to be involved process. Your second army can march west to take Parha directly, because they're not going to have an army. Like, if you send a full stack for this capital, you'll be able to out-resolve that battle, and their army is not going to be in position. So by the time, so you so you can end up in a position that when you can declare a war against Shupal Yuma, like basically vie for the crown, or you will declare a war against Shupal Yuma earlier, but once you can vie for the crown and get the legitimacy, you, you can then sell Parha or some of this area where you can take this entire province and then sell it to the Phrygians or keep it for yourself. But what you really want is to have some deal uh, is to make the Phrygians a vassal. The way you do that is generally selling territory and ultimately getting Pegela to get that gold mine. So you can get access to two gold mines and a campaign stone, wood, food and, and more stone, bronze, etc. So like once this all of this territory is under your control, you start the king taking out Shupaliuma. Dependent on the territory he has, what he has will always vary in a campaign. Relying on axemen, relying on swordsmen, relying on armored spears will do the trick. Range units, yeah, you can use skirmishers if you want to. They can be useful. Actually, one of the things that's a bit surprising to me, like if we look at these guys, right? They're heavily armored. They're armored, Hittite, Skirmishers, they could have a good amount of armor piercing. They have, like, if we look at their melee stats, so they, uh, so the regular is so an axeman. They get 34 melee attack, 46 melee defense. If we look at skirmishers, they have lower, but it isn't, but it's actually greater than what the spearmen do. Now, the downside, of course, is that there's generally less models from, uh, from what I can tell, with like these kind of units. Like, there's generally less models with the range unit, but it is a range unit. So you, you expand ammunition, and once you expand the ammunition, you go into melee. You can go, do quite well with armored Hittite skirmishers over here. Don't bother with chariots. But yeah, once all of this territory is under your control, you do go deal with Shupal. You might engage in a civil war. If you can recruit a third army, there's something you can really do with that third army. You can march on Cyprus. Now, here's the reason you want to do so, if you can hold it. Keep in mind, the Sea Peoples, they're, they start near Cyprus, so... Cyprus uh, is one of those high risk, high rewards targets. It has the most bronze of any province in the game. So if you can hold it, you can make a ton of money. And factions will give you many other resources, bronze, because there's not really a whole lot of bronze. So getting access to the to all of Cyprus and the factions here are weak. In particular, the one that starts with a minor settlement here, they're going to be annihilated. And actually, both of them, like I the first sea people's strong. invasion, can annihilate them very quickly in a campaign. And then once you, you know, once you've secured your position, you are going to want to decide, okay, who do I vassalize? Who do I wipe out? Um, typically, there are some factions that don't do so well in vassalization, though which factions do well and which factions don't, it's a bit weird. Sometimes I've seen them do well, but most of the time I've seen them do it poorly. The reason I don't think My Parfa is worth it, too. like you might think, oh, why don't you just go to war with the Phrygians? Well, it would take more effort. And you would have to hold this territory and Rogar Caskian spawn there, that Rogar army is going to spawn there. I think the Phrygians generally, the Phrygian or, AI is blood. generally better than the Far Parha AI. Like nice the Parha AI night. is pretty terrible most of the time. There are some factions that are decent, some that are terrible. Um, so there's factions worth vassalizing. Like, like the faction over here that starts in, in the north, uh, generally speaking, I would say they, they can be worth vassalizing. Though there is a nasty habit for habit for the AI to break, like the virgins in general are just worth vassalizing, I would say, in the campaign, and you conquer the Hittites. It is worth having vassals, because with the ancient legacy you're going for, you will gain more points to it based on how happy your vassals are with you. So getting the two Phrygian factions over here uh, to the north under your control, they, they, that can really be beneficial in your campaign. Now, how would this really look like? Let, and I'll take a look at the court. So I have a campaign turn, 22 turns in over here as Corunta.
Okay. So keep in mind this is a modified campaign, so what I'm able to afford over here is something you wouldn't afford you by default, afraid. but actually you would, believe it or not. Well, maybe not three armies as I do have over here, You'll but two certainly you can. So I've recruited a bunch of Cascan warriors, Esso and um, Axemen, Luian Spearmen, Luian Swordsmen, Hittite Archers, Armored Hittite Skirmishers. Yeah, a couple archers don't hurt, like, you know, having that extra range can hurt. So I've taken over all of this territory. I took a good portion of the Parha province, sold it to the Phrygians. They did lose the settlement, but I did get Pegela under my control. I have an army marching over here in Ansira, and I'm going to take uh, the capitals and half. Like, uh, just using Luwian Swordsmen, <laughs> like Luwian Swordsmen, while they don't have the range, uh, the melee capability, they're still heavily armored units or reasonably heavily armored units. So right now I've got one of Shupaluma's armies bottled up in Kadesh, and yeah, I've gotten some vassals. Made diplomacy easier. Now, let's talk about Ancient Legacy. So you got the Benevolent, and depending on how your vassals feel towards you, uh, depending on that particular situation, they, you know, you're going to get points, and you're going to get gratitude effect. So the higher the gratitude, the more courtesy gifts, but you obviously can spend some of these points. You get expert builders, so instant construction for free, equipment and celery, uh, embed for enforcer for free, court action for free, and you get tempered by war, which gives you more experience per battle to all units. And yes, the civil war is in full swing. Though there's not really a whole lot of factions that are, they are part of the Civil War. It's basically just myself and uh, just myself and Shupaluma. And yeah, he does have more legitimacy than me. Like, this is the thing. It's difficult to overcome Shupaluma because he is quite very, very powerful. Uh, keep in mind when the Civil War ends, like the war between yourself and Shupaluma does end as well, I believe. Like, that's what happens in Egypt. So keep in mind, like, you might want to leave Shupaluma alive. Or you might want to take territory and, I don't know, potentially vassalize him. It is possible once you remove him from the Great King power. Like, whoever is a Great King or a Pharaoh cannot be vassalized. But once you remove them from that position, it is possible. And there's a lot of rogue armies spawning from north, west, and the sea. Now... In terms of the court, let's talk about that. The you can go for the high commander peace. position to we reduce to, no um, work. Uh, to to reduce the wages, like over here, like axe units and um, or like actually, uh, like Kapeshi. Yeah, let's go with that. So that's what I would benefit from. The high judge, getting courtesy with the high judge, whoever that is, or occupying it is great because you can get a ruling every Shemsu Hor, or even two actually if you're a high judge. And a ruling, what it does, it gives you an event for various benefits. Can be influence, can be happiness, can be a lot of resources, so bear that in mind. Uh, the um, Tukanti, basically a spy master, is like he can give you an extra, uh, like, um, he can give you extra court actions if you're if you're him. The chief of the royal bodyguards he gives stronger bodyguards, and the lawgiver visits sacred lands and lowers building costs on Shemsu Hor. Uh, the high commander, the blade of Hattie. the high commander also gets these units like, uh, well, the king also gets this like royal Hittite chargers, royal Hittite chariots. The Mesedi as well. So, like, if you want some heavily armored units with clubs, uh, and if you want chariots, yeah, they're expensive, undeniably so, but they are available if you get that particular position. Though, I would argue quite strongly that the benefit of this position is lowering army, uh, uh, lowering uh, army recruitment for uh, certain units. Now, one of the things to mention about being king of the Hittites, if Here's we're looking at the power of the crown, we have is that you require a significant amount of influence, or legitimacy rather, you require a significant amount of legitimacy to get these powers. So while Shupal Yuma can, is very strong from early on, and Corinta can become very strong in terms of vassalization, you're not going to get the full powers of the King of Hati until you take a significant amount of territory, and specifically sacred lands, or you fight the ridiculous amount of battles. It took me 
60 turns basically to unlock everything. This was in a modified campaign and I had to go in Egypt. <laughs> like I took all of Canaan, Hati and good portions of Egypt before I was, or a decent portion of Egypt before I was able to unlock the 500 legitimacy that this required. 500 is certainly a great deal uh, that is required in, in a campaign. Now, in terms of gods, so if we're looking at the gods, you start worshipping Kurunta. Now, the benefit of worshipping Kurunta is that he gives you a desert immunity attrition, movement on sea and land. For devoted generals, you restore movement after battle, you get the charge bonus for your army, speed, RSI. So that's the benefit Kurunta is going to have, because you should, you know, get that. The shrines also give you influence. In terms of other gods, uh, in terms of the other gods, like if we're looking at the Egyptian uh, gods, you can uh, benefit from arena in terms of happiness, if you so desire. And she will also give armor, upkeep, and charge bonus for her devoted general. But there are some other benefits you can also use for gods, like specifically some of the Canaanite gods can, um, or one of the Canaanite gods uh, can be particularly useful. Like you could go with L. If you want to get more movement and land and sea, you could go with Asherash to get desert immunity um, and upkeep for a prayer. But it is increasing uh, in influence in an enemy region. Okay, so you're increasing uh, influence. But you are decreasing happiness and you are getting that desert um, immunity. You could go with Yam to reduce bronze and gold upkeep if you want to. Now, of the Canaanite gods, who would I go for, personally? That is a bit of an interesting question, really. I mean, you don't need missile resistance against missiles, so... Workforce growth, kind of useful, but you don't need missile resistance versus missiles as the Hittites, because Hittites are pretty strong in that respect. Arena isn't a bad choice, and she is the choice that Tripoliuma has, and it's, it's a pretty decent enough choice. Taruna might be might be actually end up being the best choice because one of the like you lower the morale of enemy armies if you pray you lower the fat the fatigue build up you get more armor which is never bad you increase uh, you get fury charge yeah I would probably go with Taruna as my second choice or Arena that would be the decision of a single god but yeah Corinthians. Corinthus is not a bad choice. As a third god, because keep in mind you can have three deities, as a third god, that is, uh, well, something Egyptian would make sense. You can go with Fa. Now, this is a double edged sword, so keep in mind that. Now, on one hand, he would give you a lot of gold during crisis and prosperity, more during prosperity. The problem is. If you build a lot of shrines to Fa and you end up in collapse, then you will start losing a lot of gold and you will go bankrupt. And the way the system works in the game is like, it doesn't matter how much you're getting from vassals or, you know, from bartering. It's like, if you're losing that much gold, you're going to really lose a lot of gold. So is a double-edged sword over there, but he could be a good third god, build a lot of shrines, get the significant amount of gold income. Horus is a great choice because of the influence benefit, movement range, movement on land to reduction for enemies. Horus is a pretty solid choice. Uh, Isis, pretty great choice. Um, a pretty great choice for a devoted general because of the influence, the work workforce cost reduction, the workforce growth. Like Isis is really strong. Uh, Tostrit starts with uh, worshiping Isis, by the way. Set, I would not necessarily bother with. A moon bit of a benefit but yeah like I would really argue like Isis would be a great choice you can always go for Anubis if you want to for that armor bonus though I'd say Anubis is more useful for an Egyptian because yeah the armor situation is not great for Egyptians like yeah Horus, Fa or Isis are probably the three best gods you could go for um, in a campaign really beyond the one you start with anyway that is all Questine here, signing out. Don't forget to subscribe, like, and enable notifications, and stay tuned for more.